your organization and something that is new for our committee and we will hopefully be updating our appearance cards to reflect it as your Twitter names. Uh, so without further ado. Hi, um, I'm Paula Siegel. I'm the director of 596 Acres. We are New York City's community land access advocates. Um, we work with the city's open data, so it's interesting to be here at this committee meeting. Thank you for giving me a few moments to testify about how data information and the freedom of information law currently impact our, our work. On Twitter, we're 596 Acres. It's very simple. Um, I'd like to add a note about the FOIL campaign that led to the release of the map Pluto data from behind a 10-year-old paywall, which put a $3,000 price tag per year on advocates having accurate financial and ownership information by parcel for properties in the city. Um, in partnership with the CUNY Center for Mapping and Beta NYC and our friends in the media, we mobilized dozens of successful FOIL requests for this data set and each one was promptly provided by the Department of City Planning for the cost of duplication. Five DVDs, each in its own jewel case, and each one with a price tag of $1. So through the Freedom of Information Law last year, advocates were able to get for $5 what community groups had paid thousands of dollars for in the decade before. It was a welcome relief to see that the Department of City Planning chose to make the information available through a download link without the need for a formal FOIL request and to eliminate the paywall entirely after several, several months of the campaign. It's also my hope that the fees paid in, by advocates and community-based organizations over the, past, over the past 10 years will someday be refunded. Our campaign serves as a great model for the implement, implementation of the Open FOIL Bill. I would urge that one request should be enough to make it mandatory that an agency post a requested document online. We shouldn't have to stage a campaign. To support our core work and create the most accurate available map of vacant publicly owned lots that present opportunities for community land access, we've used two of the data sets currently in the open data portal. Uh, the new data set we've created is pretty good, but it's not perfect and we regularly rely on FOIL requests to fill in gaps we revealed in agency plan information and in procedure. I'm here today in support of a centralized FOIL portal that will make it easier for us to do our work. It will also make irregularities and full responses that regularly mark our correspondence much less likely. As then public advocate de Blasio's report noted, agencies tend to expedite or delay requests based on, based on the identity of the requester. In our experience, this prejudicial treatment goes even deeper. I'm going to bring one example to the attention of the committee, an example that's kind of sweet and it illustri and illustrates that even where agency records access officers have the best intentions, the current process doesn't reliably produce documents that, as they are requested. There's a swath of properties in the Melrose section of the Bronx that are slated to become a park under the Melrose Commons and Urban Renewal Plan. Uh, I spoke with the, with the Bronx Borough Parks Office Manager who assured me that they were working on it and that she would follow up with an email telling me what the plans were for the site. And after not hearing from her for a month, I put in a FOIL request. Um, I referred to the property by its borough block and lot number, by its name in the urban renewal plan, and by the parks department name, it's, it's being called the Melrose Commons Park. Um, what I received, the, re the request was acknowledged within five days and I re received a requ response within 20 as the acknowledgement had promised. But what the response revealed is that the staff at parks knows who I am, they know what we do, and they didn't necessarily read the request. They didn't disclose anything related to the site, to the bl borough block and lot numbers that I had actually requested. Instead, they sent a couple of copies of community garden licenses for gar gardens in the neighborhood of Melrose Commons with different names and clearly different block and lot numbers. Our core work is making s these spaces possible, but that wasn't what I had asked for. So it's a sweet error, but it exposes the quixotic nature of current agency responses to FOIL requests. We're looking forward to a more transparent and streamlined process that will make such errors less likely. Thank you so much. Hello, um, I'm Rebecca Williams. I'm up from DC from the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, my role there is a policy analyst on the local uh, team. So I look at open data laws across the country and um, I'm, I'm going to go a little off script and just tell you guys 
um, what else is happening and why this is, I, like John said, um, overdue, not actually new. Um, there, there's a lot of examples out there of things like this already happening, and I'm happy to support each one of these bills and even other bills that aren't at this hearing today that are relevant to transparency in New York City. Um, so just uh, going through them, first the, the open uh, law bill. Um, what's important about um, New York City's uh, current law online, sure, you can, you can look at it in the browser and search by keyword, but it's not structured. No one has talked about licensing. Looking at um, the New York legal publisher, it doesn't seem to have an open license. Um, we had something similar actually happen in the District of Columbia last year. Uh, we had a software developer that wanted to create a bike app, and he wanted to include bike laws in his bike app. Thought it would be simple enough, not simple. There, it wasn't structured, there's was no API, also it was licensed, so it was illegal for him to include his bike law in his bike app, and that is essentially the situation in New York City right now. And uh, in a world where you can get so much on your cell phone, uh, laws should be the simplest thing to get online. So, so there's a lot that could be done there. Um, and two, I think, um, points made earlier about not everyone having online access, that's more reason for having APIs. A lot of people don't have online access at home, but they have online access on their phone. So you're actually addressing a lot of the digital divide issues if, if you're getting things on people's phones. Um, to the point about the open FOIL portal, um, this is really, really exciting stuff. I think collectively all of these bills are sort of filling in what might have been not addressed in the open data legislation of New York. Um, just to zoom out a little bit, um, since th there's now 40 open data laws on the books across the country. Uh, that's a lot more than there were in 2012 when New York City passed their open data law. Uh, all of these bills address data that isn't just automatically structured and easy to release, but information that is the public's and that you can get in other ways and is just difficult. Um, so addressing their structure and their format and making them more available um, makes sense. Uh, the examples of Oakland and Chicago and the feds were already brought up in terms of FOIA requests online. Uh, in addition to Chicago, Cook County, included their FOIA logs be included in their open data portal in their open data law, so that's happening elsewhere. Um, and then internationally, uh, Ala Vitelli, the, the, the international service is in over a dozen countries. Uh, th this is something that's not new. Um, and it, other places have been doing it for years. And New York City should do it because they've been a leader in open data to begin with. And I, I don't think you guys should lose your lead. Um, and then the last point, the, the um, city record online, there's a lot of procurement information there that if you structured it and made it more available, and made it available in bulk, not just searchable online in the browser, but made it available to download so that you could actually do real analysis about how the city functions. All, all of this data is the harder data. It's not the, just the spreadsheets you put on the open data portal. It's the stuff that lets citizens know how New York City is functioning. And it's incredibly important that these are passed. And if you guys need any advice from Sunlight, let us know. Great. Um, I'm, there's been so much information. I will read my initial comments in and then uh, riff. Uh, hi, my name is Noli Delgo, Executive Director of Beta NYC. It's a great honor to represent New York City's technology community, particularly a rather group active group of technologists, the Civic Hacker. Beta NYC works to create a New York City government for the people, by the people, for the 21st century. We meet regularly to develop new avenues for civic engagement. We're members of the New York City Transparency Working Group. Collectively, we want to see our city adopt tools, programs, and law that increase transparency, efficiency, and participation. Last year, our community published the People's Roadmap to the Digital New York City. This is a manifesto combined with 32 ideas into a foundation for a 21st century government. Today, we are here to talk about a critical component of the roadmap, access to information. Today's hearing covers three laws with historical importance. According to a recent survey, most New Yorkers have cell phones, 98%. 50% of them have smartphones, and 40% of them have tablets and e-readers. Within a few short years, a majority of New Yorkers will receive a majority of their information via mobile devices. To ensure content delivery across all devices, we need information to be open and in machine-readable formats. 
We kindly ask the council to add bulk data access and machine readability to improve intro 149 and after this testimony or the testimony that was previously given help with getting access to the city law department to improve the system that they're thinking about working on. Uh, additionally, by placing the law and city register online in machine readable formats, New Yorkers can connect to their government regardless of privilege or device. Lastly, we feel that this open FOIL bill prevent, uh, presents a transformative opportunity to increase access and to lower the cost of government operations. Just as the first online search engines gave us the ability to see the World Wide Web, this FOIL amendment gives the public 21st century processes to know how, when, and where information is being kept. We need this law. We need to have the one strike you're in provision. This is the only way that this set of laws will really carry forward into the 21st century. We believe that these three bills provide a proper foundation for the 21st century New York City government, and we support the passage of these three bills and the great research that reInvent Albany has provided by Beyond Magic Markers. Let's talk about the digital divide. This is uh, great to have you come here and to be able to talk about um, such technical things. Uh, during my primary, I was actually working with a small firm called Civic Actions that was trying to provide uh, accessibility for healthy eating in uh, California. And so I actually, I myself got to work with their team on developing a Drupal module, free and open source, that allowed us to crunch uh, nodes uh, which were effectively recipes and send it out to people over feature phones. Uh, and because of how open Drupal is, that was something we can do. Can you tell me more about how we could make government data accessible through feature phones, which are just not, not fancy phone, not fancy smartphones, but literally like Nokia's with like a, a, a keypad, no letters, and where you have to hit a key multiple times in order to say C instead of A. Um, so there are a number of ways that that uh, access can be provided to feature phones. Um, primarily, you can use the two features that are on a feature phone, voice and SMS. And third, well actually, uh, less used so now is WAP, which is you know a very scaled down web browser. Um, but there are programs and services that are currently being rendered using um, uh, voice recognition for subscribing to uh, government services um, and also SMS. Um, you know, if we're thinking about bridging the technological divide, we really need access to that raw information to then build um, uh, IVR and SMS systems where you, where you can subscribe to alerts. Uh, case in point, at the New York State Senate in 2009, we had prototypes where you could subscribe to bill updates via SMS. So as a bill made its way through the State Senate, you could actually see what was going on with the action of that bill. You did not need to have a smartphone later on when you had access to it. You could go and subscribe or you could go look up that bill number and see what was going on. Um, consequently, that's something that could happen with the city register. You subscribe to a key set of terms of looking for, you know, a type of contract or a key piece of information. And on a daily basis or whenever they come up, just like we have through NYC Notify, you would get a notification that something has happened for you to go take a look at that. That actually, I think, increases access, bridges the printing divide, and takes us into the 21st century. So if we made an open API around our information, could a third party developer um, or a civic activist or somebody wanting to make money offer this message service to people? I, and you don't necessarily have to start with the API. It's just about getting bulk access. So um, in the course of this bill as it's written, if it was uploaded to the um, city open data mind, the city open data mine or data catalog already has an API infrastructure. So one doesn't necessarily need to go through and architect a new API. But 
nor necessarily legislate the fact that there needs to be an API. What just needs to, we need to have the ability to move it out of whatever structured system it's in and that it's locked into, and we need to have that data provided in a, a non-proprietary machine-readable format. And then we can allow for a thousand flowers to bloom. I, I don't want to follow that up, but um, it, you can check out Sunlight Foundation's Call on Congress tool, which is built on structured data. Um, I, I would also add that on, on top of digital divide issues, just uh, ADA concerns. The, the more you structure data and format it so the computers can read it, the more you're actually opening it up to, to people that can access it in a variety of ways through other technology devices. I would be remiss if I failed to recognize that we were joined uh, by Council Member Richie Torres uh, for this hearing. Um, with regard to uh, the 596 acres FOIL request, do you believe that the person responding to your FOIL request would have done so differently had they had to post it online for the entire world to see? I have to assume they would. Just a little bit, just a little care. I mean, every single property in the city essentially has a barcode, right? It's a borough block and lot number. And it's a very simple, you know, I, even if they wouldn't have responded more carefully, somebody in their office would have seen it or somebody else would have seen it and pointed out the error. It's, it's, it's a, just a totally different set of numbers, the documents that they sent. With regard to open foil, I was aware of what was happening in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in other countries? And uh, perhaps if you can share the code that they are using, the only code I was aware of was the code from Code for America, which I actually downloaded last night, or not last night, but over the weekend, and was playing with. And it's Python code. It's a couple of short lines. It's very elegantly and well written. So. Sure. So I'm not. I actually. I'm. I'm not super familiar with the back end of Alavitelli, but the the tool is called Alavitelli by my society. Um, it. Noel might have more details on this actually, but it, it um, is the back end to the What Do They Know site, and it's deployed in like 15 countries. Um, it also the the thing that's different than um, the Oakland portal is that they include data sets attached to it in some countries. So they're they're doing what OpenFOIL is internationally. But I do know the record track team looked at the Alavitelli code to inform their their code. So you might see some of that um, reused or it was informed by that. So it's all part of the same OpenFOIL family. What's the URL? Um, I tweeted it earlier, Ben. I don't I'll <laughs> take a look at it. We. My Society is the organization based out of the UK, but they, they've been doing this for years. Perfect. Uh, what policies or procedures exist in other cities, states, and countries to protect reporters? I, th so the international examples would be the ones to look at since they're attaching the data with the request, um, not just showing the FOIA log of what was requested. Um, uh, we've had debates about this internally at Sunlight, and we've talked about like a three-day delay for journalists because we have journalists that work in our organization. Um, but I, it's my personal feeling uh, that the 10-day the stipulation should be sufficient. Would, you, would this panel be friendly to the 30-day request or the six-week request, which would put it at around 45 days? I have many concerns about and these different types of delays. Um, I mean, my fundamental concern is why uh, government should be transparent. And if its accountability or if its actions aren't transparent, then they should have systems and procedures in place to be as transparent as possible. Um, and if it takes the public or you know any entity to request it from government, government should be responsive to it. Um, I struggle with. Um, kind of default delays in the system. Um, I think that's just something that needs to be negotiated and it's kind of hard to put down a specific term. If the administration has specific examples of, of different types of FOIL requests that need intentional types of delays due to security concerns or other type of processing, I want to be respectful of that. Um, but I. I think that the intent, as demonstrated earlier, is that there should be as much transparency and openness as possible. 
um, with as limited delay as possible. Um, and I'd like to ask the council to represent our, uh, uh, our faith in you to get that done. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to the uh, city record online, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of uh, bulk download? I think you touched on it, but if you could help us understand why it's so important and why the current implementation where you can search for certain items but not everything and items are missing and you have to go through their search interface and it is not an open, why, why does it matter? The power of bulk downloads mean that you can really do some serious analysis on it. You can see where things are missing. You can see where things line up. It, it, it's real accountability. Being able to search things in a browser limits your um, ability to analyze that information. I think some of my concerns are around um, a limited access or a limited number of resources that the city record has right now. Um, so because it traditionally has been under-resourced, um, the technology product that they would end up producing may not be as, as advanced or as forward-thinking as um, if you had spent millions of dollars on it. Um, and so ensuring that there is kind of like a, not to use the proverbial you know, hacker term, but there is, there is a backdoor access to that information, which effectively is a bulk data download, um, one can either do analysis on it or put it in a way that's more useful for a developer. Um, you know, we're seeing consistently from different city agencies, including, you know, ones that are supposedly flying the city flag about being open data, just not producing accurate and clean data. Um, and so we want to be able to go through and make sure that we have um, clean information to work with when we're doing either analysis or hopefully building tools that help bridge the digital divide. How important is it to make sure that when we are publishing information, we're publishing it in paper and circulating it to a couple of hundred people in the city? Is it, is it worth in your mind $1.2 million <laughs> to circulate the city records so that it's available uh, in print between the hours of nine and five at a library versus on a computer terminal in that library or et cetera. Is there, should we be redirecting that cost savings elsewhere or is it a, an essential public purpose that we print it and make it available in government offices if somebody can find out which government office, where that government office is and arrange an appointment for a public inspection? So making the information available to people who do not have their own device or just simply aren't comfortable or don't trust information that comes from their phone um, is incredibly important. But that can be done with staff, right? That can be done with staff and training, staff that is available to read that information from a digital interface between the hours of 9 and 5 in certain government offices and libraries and actually producing paper documents may be redundant if there is well-trained staff at the community board offices, say, that can actually understand the information as it's published digitally and assure a resident who wants that information that this is the city's information, it is official, and give them exactly what they're looking for. Um, on the other hand, without that staff person and without having the information in paper, I think we're really walking a, t a fine line what we do is actually put signs up around the city in areas where there is vacant city-owned land. So we mirror our online database with actual physical interventions in space. And I think I would encourage the city to do the same. Yeah, I agree that uh, paper is still useful in, in certain instances. I, I would encourage the city to do analytics on who's using the paper product versus who, who's accessing it online. I think you'll find that more people will be accessing it if you make this available in structured open format. Do we have Google Analytics for paper printing yet? You can. You, you can do barcodes. I mean, the, the Department of Buildings um, under the previous administration worked on uh, particular QR codes and URLs that were accessible uh, via paper to keep a track of who's using, or at least that was part of the, the initial white paper 
of like who actually uses this QR code uh, to access this piece of information. Um, I think that there's in particular uh, explicit value in having paper, um, but the content, if you look at every other ma major news organization, they're going to digital first workflows. Um, there's, it's, it, once you have adopted to 21st century business practices, um, it is as simple as writing a script to say print out every article, as simple to say print out you know, a subsection of, of these different articles uh, onto paper. I think that they would be, um, uh, if properly engineered, architected, and thought through, which as the largest city in North America we are, we can do, um, that the city record can be designed in such a way that for those people who need print, that we actually provide a better product than what's currently being provided. If you ever take a look at the physical print of the, the city register, um, the print is small, um, sometimes it's unreadable. Um, I think that we could produce a better digital first than to print product that services the needs of all New Yorkers. I think if we were to go to a digital print process, we could easily translate the city record to the multiple languages that are in the city using crowdsource systems or automatic systems. Like we're getting to a point where we can actually service more people um, by going through a digital first process than to ensure or enshrining a paper process. So the city record might be more useful if when you showed up at the library, you said I'm interested in seeing what community board meetings are happening or whatever, or I just want it today. And it might be cheaper to actually just have the library and press a button to print out the city record in the language, font size, and section that the person wants versus a, a city record for $1.2 million that's just circulated everywhere. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> I, I'm seeking to elicit testimony with leading questions. <laughs> I mean, but there's, uh, there should be also kind of the traditional, there, the, and, and I think th there's a place in the middle and that place in the middle is the fact that there is still going to be a product that need, that people will need, um, that they will want in a in a format that they are comfortable with, because you know print is still a user interface, um, something that they have become accustomed to. Um, I think that that's something that can be evolved into a particular direction, but I I don't think that there is a paper first mentality that um, that should continue in the 21st century. Um, and so finding some type of accommodation between the two. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I want to thank Rebecca for coming all the way up from D.C. Uh, before <laughs> I gavel out, I'd implore all of you to please join us, uh, join me at MIT Media Lab on uh, this Friday, uh, where we'll be working on a hackathon to hack the law. And then uh, please join Beta NYC and their civic activists, which are more local and in New York City, on um, their various civic hacking projects. So uh, thank you all, and I uh, now adjourn this meeting.